Let's take a look back in history today and discover what it was like to drive a car in the 1890s. The first car with a combustion engine was built by Carl Benz and they did the first test runs in summer 1885. He filed a patent application which was granted in 1886. So in the 1890s cars were already a couple of years old, but Benz still refused to sell any cars, even if customers came into his workshop and put money on the table. He said, we shouldn't sell cars because the problems are still too severe and even we as the designers, mechanics and engineers cannot cope with the problems properly yet. The general car industry consisted of Benz in Mannheim and Daimler in Stuttgart. Both put a small and fast running combustion engine into a simple frame with three or four wheels. These vehicles were then produced and licensed in France and Great Britain where people were much more open minded to the new technology and brave enough to drive cars. So how did cars look like at the time? This is a small car and this is a big car. And by the way, we see here Carl Benz driving the Benz Victoria, his favorite car, which he drove until the end of his life in 1929 when cars already looked like this. So let's go a bit deeper into the technical details of these first cars. At Benz cars, the engine was a lying one cylinder in the back. It had a horizontal flywheel to avoid any pitch moment. They then used a lever bell to transmit the power from the engine to the differential, which was just what people knew from working with steam engines at the time. One side of the belt wheel wasn't fixed on the shaft and could spin freely. That was your neutral. To start driving, you pushed the belt on the wheel which was fixed on the shaft with a fork. So the lever belt was clutch and transmission at the same time. From the differential, the power was transmitted via a chain either side to the rear wheels. This allowed enough play between sprung and unsprung parts of the car, because a live axle wasn't invented yet. So that also meant these first cars didn't have a reverse. Later they added a second forward gear, so you could push the belt a bit further and cars reached around 18 km per hour. When they later wanted to add a reverse, when cars got bigger and heavier, they didn't have enough space for three belts next to each other, and so Benz used a planetary gearbox, something he designed already back in 1887, which was a very elegant solution. And keep in mind, Benz built everything for his cars in-house. So now cars had three forward gears, a reverse, some engine updates for more power, and could reach around 30 km per hour. The engines were relatively reliable compared to the rest of the car, because there was already a lot of experience with stationary engines before people put them in cars. But stationary combustion engines often worked with gas, which was fine in a workshop. But if the engine should be mobile, it's harder to store enough gas for a decent range and so Gottlieb Daimler designed a small and fast running engine which was running on liquid fuel. And by the way, he was married to the daughter of a pharmacist. These kind of fuels were only available in pharmacies back in the day. And this situation also stayed like this until 1900, when the first fuel stations came up. So if you needed fuel, you had to go to the pharmacy and buy large portions of it. And if the pharmacy was already closed, because you got stranded in the night, you either had to wake up the angry pharmacist, because they were usually living upstairs, or you spent a lonely night outside. The cooling was done through an evaporator, so there was no water pump and it was an open system. The water was usually enough for 15 to 20 kilometers, so either you had some water with you to top up the system, or you needed a bucket to refill the water on the way. And if you didn't have a bucket with you, you had to find something else. Most men at the time used their hats to refill the cooling with water. Another frequent maintenance was the leather belt, because on Ben's cars, the engine was in the back and the car had rear wheel drive, the lever belt was pretty short. And its own elasticity wasn't enough to compensate for the clutch and transmission work. So the belt got longer and needed to be tightened every 40 kilometers. The next thing was that because all heavy parts were in the back, the front of the car was very light, which made steering very easy. But if you accelerated from a complete stop too abruptly, the car would do a wheelie and overstress the lever belt again and probably throw the rear passengers or luggage off. In terms of seating arrangement, there were lots of different concepts. The base being the two-seater. 
Then there was a so-called vis-a-vis and do-a-do, or people sitting on longitudinal benches at the back. These additional people brought some more weight on the front axle, so the wheelie problem wasn't so bad anymore as long as you took some people with you. The belt issue, however, could only be solved later when the engine was positioned at the very front, so that the overall length of the belt was much longer. Now its own elasticity was enough and it didn't get longer while driving anymore. And later came the prop shafts. The frame of the car was interesting as well. If the upper body was made of wood, it couldn't take much torsion, and to provide a stable platform the suspension was linked between front and rear. Because cars were now pushed with their rear-wheel drive and not pulled anymore like horse carriages, the steering was not a fifth-wheel steering anymore and they used Ackermann steering. If you want to know more about the odd history of the Ackermann steering and what its connection to Darwin and the Pope, check out my other video below. To save the trouble with Ackermann steering, Carl Benz used a single wheel at the front for his first car and changed later to two front wheels. The steering column was a vertical one in the middle and had a real steering wheel on the top. At the sides of the steering column were levers for throttle and ignition timing. The driver was sitting on the left in Germany and there was right-hand traffic, but more on that later. Another common problem when driving such a car was that a chain fell off. The bike chains they had at the time were too weak and self-made chains not reliable enough and putting it back on was very dirty and a tricky job. Other problems were ignition failures, failing seals or stuck valves, and later on flat spots because of horseshoe nails in the road. And that brings us to the wheels. Most of the rims at the time were wooden and fixed on the axle, so you couldn't take them off. The tires were full rubber tires with a steel cable inside. These tires were not endless and hence had a split at one point. If this split was on the ground while you turned a bit quicker or hit one of the many potholes, the tire came off. It was a large rubber steel piece which usually came off towards the driver's shoulder and if you got hit by it, you couldn't move your arm for a couple of days. Putting these tires back into the rim was one of the main jobs of early car drivers. You needed a large screwdriver and a lot of force. At the same time, you jacked the car up, but couldn't take the wheel off, so it was much, much harder. And you did this outside at any weather. Later in 1897, the pneumatic tires came up, so a tube inside and a tire outside. There was no split anymore, so this problem was solved, but suddenly the many horseshoe nails in the roads became a problem. People had flat spots all the time. So drivers started carrying spare tubes with them. But this technology was pretty new and there were lots of different sizes. Pretty often the spare tubes didn't fit and the broken one had to be fixed at the side of the road, only to fail again after a couple of kilometers. So then you had to jack the car up. Wheels still couldn't be taken off, you needed to slip the tire off the rim on one side and get the tube out. Then fix it and put it back. Pretty often the tube was also damaged while putting it back because, like with the previous tires, you needed a large screwdriver and a lot of force. And then you had to pump it. And if you broke down near a village or in a town, all this happened with a lot of people standing around the car, watching you and blocking you and telling all the best jokes in the world. People in this time created a new level of swearing. Now to the journeys. Since the first generation had a top speed of 18 km per hour, you needed around 2.5 hours for a 35 km trip when everything was going smoothly. But if you got some problems on the way, you could easily take 3 to 6 hours for the same trip, which means that you would even be faster by walking. So car drivers at this time were especially tough. These first generations of cars could only take a 7% ramp uphill. If the hill was steeper, someone needed to push. And you always drove at daylight, because either you didn't have lights or they would fail after 5 minutes anyway. Cars then got a cover, which could be folded back. It was a major job to put it back up and to strap it properly so it would be straight and stable. Also, they used some soft sidewalls, which could be connected with some buttons. But all drivers hated that job and if it started to rain, they held their hands out and said it's not so bad and it will stop in a minute. 
only to stop a while later when everybody was already soaking wet and to do it anyway. Back in the day, driving was very dusty because there were no tarmac roads. Ladies wore a dust coat and a net over their hats, which was fixed around the neck. Men had a similar coat and glasses when the speeds got faster later on. Since we talk about faster speeds, the Benz test driver took a test run through the city with an updated car. The car could now run 27 km per hour and was suddenly faster than the tram. Because the driver enjoyed overtaking the tram and the surprised faces in the tram so much, he spent hours overtaking the tram over and over again, and the next day the car manufacturer Benz got a letter from the tram company, stating that tram and cars shouldn't be driving in the same road anymore for safety reasons. But in fact, because it didn't look good on them. For car drivers at the time, everyone was your enemy, even the state himself. There was still the old middle age road tax in Germany for cobblestone roads, which made car driving pretty expensive. Horse carriages tend to drive on the wrong side of the road and only changed right in front of the cars, so cars had to brake almost to a complete stop. Drivers were then shouting at each other, so car drivers and cabbies were natural enemies. Sometimes it went so far that when horse carriages drove in the middle of the road, so cars couldn't overtake, or towards cars on the wrong side again because the driver fell asleep and all honking didn't help, car drivers got their guns out and were shooting in the air to get by. Another problem was the police, which was always accusing car drivers of something, but most of the time speeding. Sounds familiar, right? In their view, cars were always speeding. But what was speeding in the 1890s? There was no speed limit and the police didn't measure the speed. Instead, if a respected citizen like a priest, a mayor or a teacher was accusing a car of speeding, it must be true and the driver got fined by the police. In fact, car drivers had to pay so many fines that there were rumors that whole villages were rebuilt because of the new big income source. Here's one example of a German car driver in 1899. In February, the council forbids him to use roads with a width of less than 11 meters, so pretty much all roads and he has to pay a fine of 3 mark for using roads in the city before. In June 1900 he was reminded that it's illegal to park a car in public places. This would cause lots of people to gather around the car, which is blocking traffic, and they would start playing with the car's horn, which is creating noise disturbance. The fine was a massive 30 mark or jail time. A day later he was fined for speeding, which was witnessed by a teacher. The fine was 3 mark plus 1 mark service charge. Eight weeks later, he got fined by the council again for parking his car in the city for one hour. Witness was a policeman. The fine was 2 mark or 2 days in jail. And snow was a problem too. The thin wheels without thread didn't have much grip and dig deep into the snow. Roads were not cleared from the snow yet, and so car drivers had to have a shovel in their car and used large ropes around the rear wheels, like snow chains, to get through the snow better. But these ropes didn't last very long. Also, there happened a lot of accidents with horses. They turned their ears up and forward, and that was the first sign that something was about to happen. Strangely enough, they always tried to jump at the car as if they wanted to attack it. When approaching a carriage, horses blocked the way, reversed and then raced across the street from one side to the other, which caused many carriages to land in the ditch. Result of that was a big argument with the owner and pretty often there were not just words, it became a proper fight. For that reason, the horsey horseless was designed in America, with a fake horse at the front to not scare the real horses of the upcoming traffic. This fake horse also worked as a wind deflector and fuel tank. Another problem were dogs, which were suddenly running towards and into the early cars when they heard them, and many got run over. So drivers tend to use large whips to keep the dogs away. Also children, especially in the countryside, came running towards the cars and started throwing rocks and dirt towards the car. Showing them the whip was useful here. Chicken were an even bigger problem because they sat in a group at the side of the road, got nervous when they heard and saw a car, and just in the last moment they ran on the street and got run over. Geese were smarter and just stayed where they were. Also, the streets were a problem. Up until 40 km per hour they were okay, but with higher speeds the bumpy streets became increasingly dangerous. 
Country roads were sandy, cobblestone roads and the cities were bumpy, loud and expensive. Another problem, especially in Saxony, were water drains at hills which were deep cuts across the street. These dangerously unsettled the car when driving downhill and took your momentum when going up. In dry weather the streets were dusty, so cars pulled a huge cloud of dust behind them and everybody else on the street was swearing after the car. When it was wet there were so many puddles everywhere that the cars sprayed everyone and everything with mud, so cars were generally very unpopular. Overtaking was extremely dangerous because no one could see a thing with these huge dust clouds. And there was even a petition in the German parliament to forbid cars to drive on country roads. So the start of the car was not an easy one. Everybody, especially people in the countryside, hated them. And pretty often the car owners hated their cars as well when they got stranded again with one of the many problems. But there were lots of resilient car drivers and engineers in the world who worked hard to overcome all of these difficulties. Lots of designs today are being taken for granted, but it was a stony way for every single detail. So I hope you liked this look back in history and if you did please consider to become a B-Sport Club member for more videos like this. And check out my other historical videos below.